So we could literally talk for several days on how to do debugging and performance profiling applications. It's it's literally courses you would take in college. So what we're going to do today is kind of go over a summary of the tools we have available, where you can find out how to use them more, and what kind of documentation you can find for them, and kind of a, a an idea of what they do and how to use them. I'm going to start with debugging tools. And for us, it's typically DDT is the first one that we like to suggest. It's a traditional HPC parallel programming debugger. Um, TotalView is a similar tool. Um, it doesn't have quite as many bells and whistles, but it's been around longer. Um, and then there's several task-based debuggers that are typically used for serial programs, but a lot of them have parallel programming extensions added by either NVIDIA or HPE that make them usable for uh, parallel programming models. And we also have a bunch of other options that are discussed in our debug tools uh, documentation. So some of the quick best practices before you wanna get started with the debuggers um, is you're gonna to wanna to set up a remote desktop connection uh, Traditionally, X11 forwarding over SSH is quite slow, so we recommend using No Machine to improve the performance of that. You can download it and set it up using our documentation here. Alternatively, a lot of the GUI debuggers also have remote clients, so you could install that on your laptop or your desktop and then connect to Perlmutter using those. Um, and if you're going to do that, I suggest checking out SSH Proxy, which is something we have here that allows you to um, set up an SSH key that'll last for an entire day so you don't have to SSH in multiple times using your multi-factor authentication. Make sure that when you're connected to Perlmutter that you also set up the creation of core files. These are files that contain the state of memory when a program crashes, and they're common input for a lot of debuggers. And a lot of it, the generation of them is usually disabled by default. So there are some options here that can help you to generate those. When you're compiling your program, you actually have to do things differently to make sure that you get some uh, valid information when you're doing debugging. Otherwise, it's gonna come back and it's gonna look like it doesn't know where anything is or any of the line numbers or anything like that. And so what you wanna do is you wanna generate debugging symbols and you wanna disable your compiler optimizations. And for our C and Fortran compilers, you're gonna add the little g for adding the debug symbols and dash capital O zero to disable optimizations. Um, when you're doing CUDA or GPU type debugging, you wanna use a capital dash G if you want to also debug the device and make sure you see debugging information from there. And then the CUDA RT shared if you want to do memory debugging as well. Um, when you're allocating your nodes for debugging, you want to make sure that you're using the interactive queue. It's high priority. So when you go and S allocate, it should come to you really quickly. But it does have the limits of four hours maximum with four nodes maximum. If you need more than that, you're going to have to put a custom request for a uh, reservation. You're also going to want to make sure that you set the restraints properly for getting access to your correct resources, such as CPU nodes or GPU nodes. And if you're going to use GPU nodes, make sure that you set your account to have the uh, underscore little G on it. That's so you make sure that you're uh, billing the correct account for your GPU hours. And there's a couple examples here at the bottom. A note on some of the HPE Cray tools. Make sure that you make they, they make use of something called the common tools interface. Um, we have some documentation on that, and there's some on the Craze website. And some of that sometimes can require some setup. Some of the tools seem to work with it, and some of the ones don't. So I just do it whenever I use a Cray tool. Um, it's something that I've reported to them a couple of times. I'm not sure if it's ever going to change. But they might require additional setup before you use them. So we're gonna get started by looking at DDT, which is the distributed debugging tool. And right now it's being developed by Lenaro as a part of the Lenaro Forge suite. It's been developed by several companies throughout the years, and it's a very high quality parallel programming debugger. 
It supports a bunch of parallel growing models, including MPI, OpenACC, and OpenMP, and CUDA and Rockham for GPUs. We have a lot of documentation out here at NERSC, as well as the latest documentation from Lennar Home. Kind of to get the base usage for it is you're going to want to load the Forge module, compile your program, allocate your compute nodes, and then run DDT. You can optionally run the program that you want to run through ADT, or you can start DDT and then run your program through DDT, or you can attach to an already running program. The the little comments or the code here is just kind of a how to get started if you wanted to use DDT for a simple program. Uh, when you open it up, this is kind of the base of how it works. Um, like I said, you can run it or attach, open a core, or do a manual launch yourself. And when you're going to run the application, uh, this gives you some of the options for the things that you want to do like how many processes, where the application is, the arguments, and some of the features you might want to enable. And this is a base vision of what it is and what's available. It gives you the source code that you're looking for. On the left side, it gives you kind of a breakdown of all the different uh, source code um, bits and pieces that you care about, functions, uh, variables, things like that. And it gives you uh, the ability to go through processes at the top, threads, and then step through everything like a regular debugger would. Now, if you don't want to use DDT using no machine, there is a way to use the remote client. And in order to do that, basically you set up your client, you connect it to Perlmutter, and then you SSH to Perlmutter, and you start a re reverse connection, which will connect back to your laptop. We have documentation on doing that. This is a little out of scope for what we want, for what we have here, because it's very tedious. So I suggest looking over the instructions if that's something you want to do. Now with Total View, this is currently developed by a company called Perforce. Again, another debugger that's been debugged, you know, created by a lot of different uh, places over the years. It's still used by a lot of different uh, sites. And so we support it as well. Um, it has all the core languages and all the programming models that you're looking for. And again, we have a bunch of documentation and the Perforce documentation for TotalView is actually quite good as well. Again, this is very similar to DDT in that if you want to start something up, you're just going to load the TotalView module, compile your program, allocate your nodes, and run TotalView, and run your program, and or you can attach um, as needed. In this case, when you're running Total View, you're going to give some of those SRUN args over to Total View. It's not as configurable as DDT. And here's kind of a, a look at what the new user interface is for Total View. Again, very similar to what we saw with DDT. On the left hand side, you have how you can control your groups and processes and how it's going through um, the call stack. You have your source code in the middle. And then on the right side, you have the call stack where you're currently at and the local variables and their values. Again, you can set up a reverse connection here for total view. You would do the exact same thing as you would do with DDT, but with slightly different configuration where you're doing a remote, uh, you're using downloading the client, connect to Perlmutter, then you open a new window SSH to Perlmutter and start the reverse connection. Um, some notes on GDB. This is, again, the common text-based open source debugger, which I've used for a very long time. Um, that might date me. Uh, it supports all of the languages kind of out of, the, out of the base. It's traditionally for serial programs, and it has very good help. It has a good man page, and it has internal help as well. So when you run GDB, you can actually do help run for how do I run a program or help attach for how do I attach so that when you start a debugging session, you can actually get help in the session itself. Um, CUDA GDB is a uh, basically GDB with a CUDA extension um, that's uh, supported and developed by NVIDIA. And it doesn't support any other programming models, just CUDA with the base languages. And it's available as part of the CUDA toolkit. So if you already have uh, the GPU module load on ProMonitor, this is just something that you can use right now. Uh, 
HPE has something called GDP for HPC. And this kind of takes GDP and applies um, some features so that it acts more like a traditional parallel debugger, like DDT or TotalView. And then it also has some other programming models that it uh, uh, added support for in Cocos and Raja. It also has something called comparative debugging support where you can compare two programs to each other and see what the results are. Uh, it's useful if you have an older version of a program and a new version of your program and variables or, or, or in one of them is crashing and you want to figure out, okay, what are the variables at each step of each program? And you can compare that way. Um, it has very interesting way of launching and doing uh, process sets that you wouldn't kind of think about by default, but it's very intuitive, I think, once you get started. This is kind of an example of launching a Hello World app within GDB for HPC. You have the launch command that is added and new, and you create a process set called PSET that has eight ranks. If you wanted to view those that set, you would just do view set. Your backtrace command that you use in GDB is again, the same as if you would do it normally, except it shows across all your processes now. You set a breakpoint, and then it will do that at every process. You continue your run. If you want to print the value of the rank for all your processes, you just do print. Or if you just want to print a specific value for only a specific rank, you do print and then set the PSET. There's a lot of other features in here that allow you to do uh, a lot of other cool things. This is one of my favorite tools to use and like demonstrate, but there's just a lot to cover. So we're going to go past this using the example. And CCDB is the comparative, uh, Cray comparative debugger, even though HPE now owns them. Um, and it combines GDB for HPC under the covers with the GUI, again, to compare two programs in a debugging session. This is kind of what it looks like where you have this, in this case, they have two copies of HPL running. Um, one is slightly different than the other. And you can see that in this case, it's trying to do a bunch of variable comparison or expression comparisons between both programs. And it sees, oh, hey, I have some failures here. App zero differs from app one in this particular thing where, it, I, for example, it's trying to check the value of res ID zero or X normal. Everything else seems to be having the same value in both programs. And again, this is kind of just another way to help you debug an older version from a newer version. So we have some notes on STAT and ATP, two more uh, tools provided to us from Cray from outside vendors. Um, STAT is called the Stack Trace Analysis Tool, and it attaches to a job launcher process. And what it does is it gathers and merges the stack traces from all of those processes so you don't have to look at a single stack trace for all 30 of them. And when it happens then is if all 30 of them happen to have the same stack trace, it would just combine down to one stack trace and show it to you. Otherwise, it'll show you the differing ones. So let's say process one has your process or zero is your base server and that has one stack trace. And then all your other processes are clients and they have their own stack trace that they match. You'd get two stack traces from that. It supports MPI threads and CUDA using CUDA GDB that we mentioned earlier. Again, using this kind of requires that Cray CTI stuff that I talked about at the beginning. Um, and in this case, there's both a command line and a GUI based version. And again, they have very good man pages and all the other documentation that we show. And basically you're just going to be attaching to something that you S run by the PID. When you do that, you get these two stack traces out. So you can see here we have slash, which represents uh, where we're starting. And there are uh, the four there represents the four ranks, zero to three. And you can see that the ranks then start to break out into two and then three different stack traces based on the rank. And you can see that that's how that is based on where you are in time. ATP is another tool called for abnormal termination processing. This is like when your application crashes or return gets a sig term or something like that, and you don't know what to do. 
And what it does is it, hand, it registers itself as a signal handler to handle those uh, process uh, signals for your program. It uses stat underneath to create merged stack traces like you saw before with stat so that you can get some idea of what the program was doing beforehand. And then it will also at the same time selectively produce core files so that you don't produce a single core, well, you don't produce a core file for every process. You would just produce a core file for the processes that either terminated or the processes that have uh, differing core files or differing stack traces. So it only produces a small subset of core files, which can save you a lot of space and a lot of time processing. It supports MPI threads and CUDA similarly to STAT. Um, however, if you're using the GNU Fortran compiler, you need to set the F no backtrace function uh, flag um, before you run this tool. It's because the Fortran runtime for GNU, when it sees an error, it tries to automatically generate a backtrace to show you. It's only for the Fortran compiler, and I don't know why they do it. Um, but you need to disable that, otherwise it will interfere with uh, the processing that ETP tries to do. And again, a lot of weird setup with CTI. Um, you have your intro ATP man page. Um, you have an ATP enabled environment variable that you must set. And this is so that you can run ATP off or on if you want to. Uh, there's an ATP GDB binary uh, environment variable that you can set to whatever GDB you want to use. If you have a specific GDB or a specific other debugger uh, in mind that you want to use, there's an environment variable to tell the Fortran, the Intel Fortran compiler to ignore exceptions so that it won't over interfere with things similar to how the GNU Fortran compiler does. And then you just S run your program. And when the termination signal hits, ATP takes over and it tells you your application is crashing, analysis is proceeding. It'll print out a little bit of a stack backtrace. And then you can view the merged backtrace that's produced in dot format. And here's a, a small one that kind of gives an idea. You can see here that the application seemed to be going okay, except rank five went through and had a raise. And so it must have had some sort of fault somewhere in there. And the rest of it seemed to go and go be stuck in the waiting and MPI finalize. So you're able to kind of figure out where your program went wrong and in what ranks. So I have some more notes on uh, some sort of some of the dynamic um, tool checking libraries, LVALGRIND and LLVM sanitizers. Uh, Valgrind, it uses several tools to check your program for correctness um, at runtime using dynamic recompilation. And that is that it doesn't have to recompile or you don't have to recompile to use Valgrind. It works in kind of a virtual machine type scenario and it uses a bunch of different tools. The most common ones here are for a mem check, a cache grind, and a call grind to kind of give you some statistics about your memory usage. There is also a Valgrind for HPC that HPE gives us that allows us to use Valgrind on your traditional HPC type processes like MPI. If you were to launch Valgrind normally using S run across a bunch of ranks, you would have Valgrind output for every single process, which you don't want. And so what this does is it aggregates the results across all processes. And if you want to use Valgrind for HPC, there's again, the CTI setup, there's a good man page and the good help. And this gives you the option of using Valgrind for HPC, which has some of its own options, but it allows you to also pass launcher args to um, Slurm or whatever your launcher is, and then run your program. Now the LLVM sanitizers actually do require you to do a different compile because they do runtime checking based on instrumenting your source code. And these are all based on things that are available in LLVM-based compilers, though I do believe that it does support GCC as well. And some of the most common of those are checking for addresses, checking for thread leaks, checking for memory, and checking for thread problems. 
Um, again, the sanitizer for HPC uh, developed by HPE based on the similar thing. And this aggregates results again across all the processes so that each process doesn't have to output the thing, the data information, and you don't have to aggregate it yourself. And now this supports CCC and GCC. It would probably support most of the other LLVM-based compilers as well. And it supports CUDA with something called the Compute Sanitizer, which is a little out of scope at the moment. So I'll just put a link here and let you guys take a look at that later. The Compute Sanitizer is a part of the CUDA toolkit. So it already exists on Perlmutter if you want to use it. And again, if you want to use uh, the sanitizers for HPC, again, you would recompile uh, your application. You make sure to use the option to uh, use the sanitizer for, say, addresses in this case. And then you would use the launcher with uh, sanitizers for HPC so that you can make sure to run it in parallel. And that is it for the debugging tools. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to performance tools now. Everything look good? All right, we got about 10 minutes. So I'm going to, again, go through this a uh, little fast. And again, this is this is content that we could literally go for days on. Um, we have some profiling tools that are available and their usage is mainly for you to figure out any type of performance problems in your application. So you have different metrics and different criteria that you would wanna measure and analyze and try and find bottlenecks and other different problems with your codes. Now we have a full list on our, on our website, but these are just a few of the ones that we have locally and the ones we recommend Typically, the NVIDIA Insight systems, um, again, these are because they're GPU-based, and they have the ability to show you a GUI. And then we have Craypat, which works across all compilers, all GPU, almost all programming models, anything you would want to do, performance counters, Craypat does it all. I worked on Craypat myself for 10 years at Cray, so I kind of have an idea on how it works. The Insight system is a low overhead profiler, and it provides a general description of what the GPU-based application does. And you're going to want to make sure that you have uh, the CUDA modules loaded. The application must be compiled by linking in the CUDA libraries, and it supports CUDA with the NVCC compilers, COCOS, OpenMP, and OpenACC. Um, profiling for OpenMP offload based applications uses Clang++. And if you want to run your code in Scratch here, you can see how we kind of get things going, where we unload the Darshan module, because that will cause a conflict. We load the correct programming environment that you want to use. We allocate our nodes to make sure that we're using GPU nodes. And then we do an S run of the NSYS profile and we get back the information that we're looking for. So we get a text profile here with CUDA API information showing the time, the calls, and where the name of the functions that we're spending the most, uh, the name of the functions that we're using here. Um, some of the kernel names can be mangled. And you can use a C++ demangler to kind of get that information back out. But most of this is able to see what's going on. Again, we have uh, operations and average total time. And then we have memory operations using kilobytes and how much uh, size. And then here's how we visualize the results. You have a project explorer up on the left-hand side and you have a timeline view of where the different functions are, where they're being called, and for how long. Here, something is where you have a few more things, but they're a little bit more uh, zoomed in. So you can kind of see that you have some mem copy, and you have down here in the CUDA part, you have CUDA mem copy HD to sync. And you can see at the same time that the OS is polling and doing other things.
Here we have some OpenMP offloading that's happening. So you can kind of see that this is using OpenMP, and, uh, but with the GPU offload. And we have the CUDA information going on as well. Here we have an event view, so you can kind of get some of the same information that you were getting um, from the profile, but for the event itself, when you're going through them. Now we're going to look at Insight Compute. Um, you have your baseline where you're setting an OpenMP parallel uh, pragma, and you're doing some compute information within this loop. The pragma is so that you offload uh, the OpenMP information uh, to the GPU if you have it set up. And this Insight Compute allows for a deeper dive for profiling GPU applications. Again, you're going to want to unload the Darshan module, unload the correct programming environment. You're going to want to allocate your nodes, and you're going to then want to run the profiler. Again, if you want to visualize your results, we suggest using NX. And this is kind of what the profiler uh, for Insight Compute looks like. It's got a lot of information that they try and show in a more usable way. I kind of I like this one a lot more than I like some other uh, profilers because while they're trying to show you all of the information, they're trying to show it in a reasonable way that you can make information or make a decision through. Like here it says that you're getting high throughput and it also is saying that your utilization of FB64 is uh, what it's doing. Excuse me. Um, it shows the current and the baseline for the two different cases. And it shows the kernel that you were currently interested in. So again, you have an improvement in AI and performance due to Adam neighbor loop fusing here. This is just kind of one of the graphs that they're showing within the uh, profiler itself. So you have some compute workload analysis here. You have things like memory throughput, your caching, uh, your memory bandwidth, your L2 compression, and it's showing your pipe utilization of, as well. So you can see your IPC information. It's so another one just in a kind of a different view of how you can see everything, where you can look at the kernel, the cache, the memory. Again, we're looking at the instructions now, so we can get the statistics on how many instructions were executed per scheduler per second. And then we have Craypad. Um, again, this is for use on Cray machines. They have a combination of GUI and text-based utilities, and there's several modules that you can load for them. The Perf Tools base module is reloaded, required to be loaded in order to use any of the Perf Tools suites. And then there's the Perf Tools module, which has the full suite of Pat Build, Pat Report, Apprentice 2, and Reveal. And then Perf Tools Lite, which is kind of a more fast and specific uh, tool where you don't really have to do a lot of the same things, but you don't also get back all of the information. Perf Tools allows you to collect all of the data and kind of slice through it as you want. Perf Tools Lite modules collect a little bit of information to give you a generalized picture of what your application is doing. And for example, the Perf Tools Lite GPU is GPU kernel and data movement with an event profile, which of course I forgot to put a T there. So if you want to profile this Jacobi solver while you're running on Scratch, you want to make sure that your object files are created in a separate step and remain present so that you can uh, prepack and make use of them later in instrumentation. So you load your Perf Tools Lite module, you make sure the create programming environment's loaded, you compile your program, making sure your object files are maintained, you allocate your nodes, you run your application. As a part of running your application, Craypat will output some stuff to standard Craypat Lite, output some tables and profile information to standard out or to a file, depending on how you set it up. Key here being that you're keeping your object files and you're SLKing to the CPU nodes. 
This is the summary of what a creep at performance profile looks like, shows you your PE information, how many cores and threads, shows you what CPU and GPUs you were using, and shows you kind of a wall time and your memory high water. Uh, let's see, this is the uh, profile table, it kind of gives you an idea of where you spent most of your time based on samples uh, taken in each one of these plots. And it, again, here you can see that the user functions is the ones you probably care about, but it does break it down to MPI functions and internal functions like this Cray memcopy roam, which is specific to the uh, compiler. Uh, we have another one here for a sample profile. Uh, we have one here that again, showing the loops, um, but this one is profile by function. Uh, again, we have line numbers if you need that information here as well. Uh, this one has the same uh, type of information. Come on. Uh, here you have energy and power usage. I get stuck with up, down, left, right here. Here you have uh, standard out and standard in, so you can see your I.O. Uh, and here you have some CUDA information. Uh, Pat, Pat report, again, like I said, you can use it for a full collection of things. And then you can view the data in Apprentice 2 by uh, creating your data directory and running pat report on it. And Apprentice 2 has just a bunch of different things that you can view, the generalized setting, the profile. Uh, you have a call tree. You have your samples and where they took place. You have a PE activity tree, so you can see where activity is happening over time. And you have a communication matrix. All right, and that's it. Thank you.